be too excited to do that. Um, you'll got coffee, we've all had coffee. Yeah. Organization I've been working with for probably four years. Hi. Probably four years, maybe a little longer. Um, and how they applied lean startup principles to their business before we even knew there were lean startup principles. Okay. And I've learned a lot from these guys. The only thing that bothers me about them is I didn't write these down before Eric Rice. And I could have written the book if I'd have paid more attention. Okay. So we'll have some fun. Ask me questions as we go. Right? I'm not selling anything, but I am going to challenge you at the end. So there are some things that I'd like you to do at the end of this. If you're up to the challenge, that's great. If not, help keep the people who say they're up to the challenge honest. Ooh, it's kind of cryptic. I'll come back to that later. First of all, I work for ThoughtWorks. My name is Paul Hillary, by the way. I work for ThoughtWorks. Um, and I just want to, want to thank ThoughtWorks in a way because we have three pillars that we build our business on. One is it must be a sustainable business. You've got to make money, right, before we go out of business. So we've got to make money. Two is that we're trying to um, really introduce software excellence to our clients and our not-for-profit uh, organizations. We do a lot of pro bono work for not-for-profits. And the third one that really fits with, with this session is our social justice piece. We're always looking for opportunities to, we call it improve the world, make things better. And that just doesn't mean charity giving money away, that means making people's lives and situations better. And it's that third one that this, this session is all about. Um, and because of this belief in, in the company, I've been allowed time and effort and resources to get involved in this work, which I find very exciting. So I want to just figure out what affinity groups we are in here. You all know what affinity groups are, right? It's a mob that you belong to. So any soccer fans? Two, three, four, okay. So who do you support? You must support somebody. Sure. I'm sorry? Colorado Rapids. Oh, the Rapids, okay. <laughs> Sorry, did I say that? <laughs> Who else? <laughs> Arsenal. <laughs> I know a joke about that, but I can't tell it in mid-company. Uh, <laughs> any other teams that you support? No? Well, you're all wrong, because there's only one real team. <laughs> <laughs> it worked, it's leaving. <laughs> um, been a Manchester United fan since I can remember. I grew up near Manchester, uh, on the coast, small town called Fleetwood on the coast in England. Um, and I've always supported Manchester United even when we suck. So I've stuck it out through thick and thin. Um, every Saturday or Sunday morning, you can catch me in my chair at home watching uh, Fox Soccer Channel or NBC at showing at National Premier English Premier League this year. Okay, and the bad for NBC. So big soccer fan. That's part of the group, and part of the thing that got me to this. I'm also a soccer referee. I've been a soccer referee for 20 some years. So here's the plug for the conference. Don't forget the cards. Okay, this is a good one. This is not so good, and if I do this to any of you, you've got to leave the room. Okay. So please put the feedback cards in there later. Only green ones. I took all the others away. So my, my love of soccer really got me involved in this. I was looking for some way to get involved in something, not sure what, um, some years ago. So how can I get involved with soccer in Africa? Um, I've got an affinity for Africa as well. Okay. Second affinity group. Who's read the book? At least you're honest, because usually when I ask that, everybody puts their hands up. I say, great, what are the principles? And everybody puts their hands down. <laughs> so, so good. I'm, I'm going to ask you guys something about the book a little later. Okay. Um, third and final affinity group. Who actually is involved and interested in people making a difference for themselves? Not just charity, but for themselves, empowering themselves. I thought everybody might say that, right? Whether we do that at work, whether we do that in our social lives, private lives, this, this really strikes a big chord for me. Right? So those three principles, those three foundations, are what drew me to this organizational life and kicking. So I'm going to take you on a little journey. I'm going to tell you a story. The dreaded tell you a story. I'm going to show you how the lean principles fit, but we're going to travel around Africa um, to, to some places there where a life and kicking have some, some good things going on. You went, yeah, why? Because I've been to three of those. Oh, very cool. Excellent. Good, good, good. Yeah. That's great. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the two organizations, though. Alive and Kicking, these are their goals. Create sustainable employment and the manufacture of sports balls. I'm going to talk about soccer balls primarily today. They also make rugby balls, rounders balls, if anybody knows what rounders is. Uh, netball balls, that's another sport, a bit like basketball. Um, so making balls, right, sustainably. Um, encouraging
giving, I'm sorry, ensuring disadvantaged children have access to balls to play. Play is really important, right? And that's one of the principles that A&K came from, was encouraging play amongst children. And using sport to raise health awareness, not to preach, but to do the practical side, some education of health awareness. Okay, those are their goals. I think they're very admirable, and they're doing it. This is an organization I started earlier this year simply to give Alive and Kicking access to the North American market to sell their balls. Very, very simple. It's a not-for-profit organization. Any money that I make goes back to Alive and Kicking. They're not a big enough organization. They didn't want to invest in a sales channel here, so I'm helping them do that. Now, thanks to government regulation and money transfer laws, this is a lot harder than I thought. But uh, <laughs> that's all I'm going to say. So this is primarily about Alive and Kicking, not balls from Africa. Okay? Um, okay, Lean Startup. Who then, uh, so, some of you have, have read the book, right? Some of you have, have read that. Um, are you using that in your organizations right now? You don't have a chance to, just not encourage, right? It's a cultural thing, isn't it? It's a really big cultural thing. Um, those of you who have not read the book, it's actually very simple in many ways. A complex book, um, but very simple principles. I do encourage you to, to read it. I do not get a commission. There are some principles, five principles of Lean Startup. And entrepreneurs are everywhere. All of us have something in us that's entrepreneurial. Whether we let it out, whether we encourage it out, whether we, our organizations let it come out, whole different matter. But they're everywhere. I, I guarantee you that I don't know how many people at this conference, 1,500, 1,700, 1,699 of those are entrepreneurs. Right? We've all got that spirit, guarantee you. It's also management. It's not just about having a good idea, it's bringing that idea to fruition. That's the hard part. We'll have a million good ideas, get them to fruition is hard. We also learn. How many, you must all be using Agile in some manner, right? In your organizations, or you're learning about it, you're thinking about it. So one of the principles of Agile I learned a long time ago is you try something, it doesn't work, you try something else. That's what validated learning is largely about. Try something, learn from it, improve on it. Build, measure, learn, right? The idea is to turn a startup into a sustainable business, make it into a product. If I don't learn, then I'm not gonna be very successful. If I don't measure, I'm not gonna learn. And if I don't build something in the first place, I can't measure it. So that's a really important continuum. And this thing called innovation accounting, we can't lose sight of the really small, hard stuff. How do I know I'm successful? So, yeah, I know none of us like accounting when you think about being an entrepreneur, but this also is important. So these are the five main principles. I'm gonna show you how Alive and Kicking backed into these. Didn't apply them consciously, but backed into these. It's a really good crossover. Uh, I want you to introduce you to a gentleman called Jim Cogan. Um, Jim was in the uh, British military for a number of years, back in the 50s, he spent a long time in Africa uh, with what, what then was the British Expeditionary Force. Fell in love with the place and gained a huge, huge appreciation for life there. Um, when he returned to the UK, he wanted to do something to give back to Africa, something that he, he could do personally. Um, he was actually an educator. He, he worked at the Westminster School um, in, in Westminster in, in England. Um, and so he started up a number of not-for-profits, primarily around uh, children. So uh, Student Partnership Worldwide is a way of hooking up. It's like sister cities, but for individuals, for students. Hooking students together from different countries so they could understand each other, correspond, and so on. Um, Changemakers uh, was groups of students, primarily from Britain, going to Africa, a little like the Peace Corps, but more for like two or three week stints, working on projects and coming back, and then sponsoring their African hosts to come to the UK and work on projects in the UK. Reverse help, kind of cool. Very, very interesting. But he wanted to do more, and um, he, he passed on the, the baton of those two organizations um, and wanted to do more. He wanted to do something in the field of play, in the field of health, um, in Africa. But a big core was he wanted to get away from charitable giving. He wanted to be able to have a sustainable business, not just give money. right? Obviously, you've got to give money, get there, but he didn't want it to be a handout. He wanted to have, build something sustainable. So he let this idea kick around for a while until one day something, talk about a happenstance, 
he happened to be in Tanzania, walking down the street, and he saw a guy stitching a soccer ball. Um, are any of you familiar with African homemade soccer balls? They're made of plastic and bags and nets and things. Not one of those, it was a real, honest to goodness, branded soccer ball. He talked to this guy for six hours. What he learned was that there used to be a major soccer ball manufacturer in Tanzania. And then they pulled out and they went to Pakistan. And they essentially abandoned their factory. So in Tanzania is a factory full of pieces of soccer ball and equipment that they just walked away from. And this guy knew about it. He was one of the stitchers there. And he and his friends made soccer balls to give away. It was their hobby. It's kind of cool. So Jim thought about this for a while. Um, he went back to Tanzania a few times to look at this factory and talk to these people. Um, and that's where the idea was born for Alive and Kicking. So here's a principle. Entrepreneurs are everywhere. In this case, Jim wasn't necessarily the entrepreneur. The guys making the soccer balls were the entrepreneur. And he learned from them what this was about. Okay. But he was able then to say, oh, I've got an idea. Right, balls, I know I want to do that. Hmm. Sustainable business, maybe we can do that. Right? So two of the elements that he was looking for. So most of the balls are made um, in Pakistan. They're made in this, uh, can I do this yet? Yeah, they're made in this area um, around Pakistan and China. Still about 95% of the balls in the world are made there. Uh, a lot of controversy. We don't use child labor honest. It goes on a lot here. Um, but this is, this is the cheap manufacturing center of balls. Okay. Um, so any ball you buy in the U.S. probably came from here. They also produce, of course, all the raw material. The thing about soccer balls is the expensive part of a soccer ball is shipping them. Soccer ball weighs about a pound, just over a pound. But boy, is that a lot of air. Even deflated, it's still a lot of air. So shipping them is expensive. Uh, so Jim started importing components, pieces of a soccer ball, and helping these guys in Tanzania uh, get more supplies. Very, very small, tiny, tiny, tiny. Let me tell you a little bit about the construction of a, a soccer ball. There's a bladder, and inside that's the part that you blow up. There's a valve, which keeps the air in. There's a lining, which allows the bladder and the outside to slide over each other. And then there are all these little components. There are soccer balls around the room. If you want to look at how many components are in a soccer ball, um, there are quite a lot on the outside on the casing. But shipping these little pieces is really cheap. So he started importing them and getting people to make these balls just one or two at a time. Then he applied to the British government for a grant, which they gave him. Real small grant, um, it's like 12,000 pounds, what's that, $18,000 right now. And he set up a factory. So well, if I can do it in the small, maybe I can do it in the big. Set up a factory with half a dozen people in Kenya. And they started making these soccer balls. Didn't know quite what to do with them. They were still donating them at that point um, across Africa. So Jim started thinking, well, yeah, this is cool, but it's still charity. What else can I do? So he started going to, to soccer associations, football associations. Now, another principle here. Entrepreneurship is management. Merely starting a business and making soccer balls was not good enough. He now had to manage the people and the products coming out of that. Right? So, great idea, I'm doing something, Ooh, it's still a charity, I'm still giving money away. So he went to UEFA, which is the European Football Association. Um, and he talked to a number of people there. In 2005, which is a year after the Kenya factory opened, they said, fabulous idea, I want 81,000 soccer balls, and we're going to give them out all over Africa. Well, this is the old good news, bad news. Um, capacity was about 15,000 balls a year. How many years is that? It's a long time. Long time. So, and doing that, it meant that UEFA was the only customer. Right? I got, I got a nice big order, but we can't make balls for anybody else. Good news, bad news. So, being the guy that he is, um, he went to the people in Kenya and said, what should we do? We can make this factory bigger, we can hire more people, we can buy another building, da da da. People in Kenya who had now become enthused to Jim's uh, vision said, no, I don't think that's the right thing to do. Let's build one somewhere else and give another community a chance to be self-sustainable. 
It was Jim's vision, but the idea came from the people in the factory. They could have said, yeah, let's hire my cousins, my friends, my brothers, and so on. No, they wanted to spread the wealth to another, another community. So they opened their second factory in, in Zambia, which went pretty well, pretty well, for, for about a year. Um, more and more balls were rolling out. UEFA were distributing these balls all over Africa, um, and they found a problem, right? So what do you notice uh, about these playing fields in Africa? Anything, anything unusual about them? They're dirt. They're dirt. Who, you've been to Africa, what's the dirt like in Africa? Uh, orange and very sticky and very bad to get out of anything. Right, stony or rocks, they're sharp rocks, not just round rocks. <coughs> so the balls started looking like this. They wore out really, really, and this is one of the better ones. They wore out really, really quickly. So in that first year of manufacture for UEFA, yeah, they ordered 81,000 balls, but they were replacing balls about every six weeks. Not good, because then we're not reaching as many people as you want to. Right? So what do we do? Jeez, I don't know, what do we do? I know. Oh yeah, I remember this principle. Build, measure, learn. Build some stuff, measure how good it is, and learn from it. And we went through several iterations of plastic balls, these, these type balls, and they all wore out quickly. So the people in Zambia, again from the factory, said, there's got to be a better way. Did you notice where our factory is? Obviously you don't know, but it was on the grounds of Zambia, <coughs> largest um, beef <coughs> manufacturer in, uh, in Africa. So what do cows have that might be good? Leather, <laughs> right? Um, so Zambif, a side business of Zambif was selling leather. They, uh, they tanned the leather, they treated it, they tanned it, and they sold it to shoe manufacturers and people like that. So there's a factory uh, less than 100 yards away that's making leather, and we have plastic soccer balls. What should we do? <laughs> yeah, hmm, what should we do? Um, again, an initiative from the employees in the factory in the stitching center to develop leather balls, which I thought was pretty darn cool. Oh, here we are again, right? These guys said, okay, we have a good idea. We can make it better. We can manage this. And they actually negotiated a deal with Zambief to get hides at cost, to get damaged hides at cost. Why damaged? Because you can't sell those for car seats and big things, but you can make these small panels, right? You can cut around the damage. So they were getting hides at cost, almost, almost free, you know, relatively. Very cool, very cool indeed. <clears throat> and we had a big calamity. Jim died. He was on his way back from meeting Africa. Um, and he died literally in British airspace on his way back. Had an aneurysm and done. Now, you're working for an organization that's pretty small, built in your vision, you don't have any employees in the UK yet, yeah, you have a board of directors, because that's what charitable organizations do, what would you do? Any ideas? No, really, what, what would you do? I think I'd quit for a while, yeah. right? Yeah. Because this is too hard for me, right? Yeah. Any other ideas? Oh, you guys are way too quiet. All right. Yeah, you were at drinking last you, night. You, you'd let a team self-organize. You'd like, let the, well, I've got some self-organizing teams in Africa, right? Well, what do we do now? <sighs> Don't know. So, did he have a board of directors? They had a board of directors. You, you have to in the UK to be a charity. Yeah. So, hopefully they had made some provision for succession. Right. Hopefully they have not done that. <laughs> However, what they decided to do at an extraordinary board meeting is turn this, this from a charity, instead of the board now raising money and supporting these businesses in, in, uh, in Africa, they decided to make it a business. How can we make that switch? Huge, huge change in outline for, for the organization. Right. They had a gentleman uh, named Will Prochaska, um, who became a, a good friend of mine. Uh, who had that vision of turning this into a business. And he really, really pushed the people in Africa to do the right thing, to take more control. Okay, he joined, um, in, in, uh, so he was there, uh, he left recently, about, about uh, six months ago. But he was there for a long time doing this work. 
Okay, so turn from charity into a business. What does that really mean? And how do I not run afoul of the UK charity laws? Because they're pretty strict. Really, really interesting uh, type of tool there. Okay, first event was this one. What happened in 2008 in, in South Africa? Mm -hmm. Now we'll see who's a soccer fan. World Cup, right? Yeah. Remember this picture? Nelson Mandela, fantastic. What an opportunity to supply soccer balls. Yeah? Really, really good. So we opened a factory in South Africa, rather than shipping balls across the continent. Um, this is interesting because this factory, although open um, under the auspices of the board of the UK, was really opened by the factory in, uh, in Kenya, the first one that we opened. A bunch of guys traveled down there, did training, looked for a site, and really opened the factory pretty much on their own. Unfortunately, everybody else had the same idea. Millions of soccer balls, millions of soccer balls were imported into South Africa and sold below cost. Not good if you're trying to make money, right? If you're Nike, Adidas, not to name any names, you can afford to give these balls away. But if you notice, they're all plastic balls. And even in South Africa, they wore out. However, it was enough to drive us out of, out of the country. We couldn't do it any longer. We we're losing too much money. However, there were some other things that we learned from this. It wasn't just about losing money. We found that the economy in South Africa was a lot stronger than the economy in the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa. So they didn't need this. It was just in the factory. They never took real ownership. It was a job to the people in the stitchery there. There was no desire to be an entrepreneur. They just wanted their, their weekly pay, and then they go home. Um, absentee rates were about 25%, 30% on a bad day. Absentee rates in the others are almost non-existent. Okay? So we learned a lot about the sort of places we could go. South Africa, probably not a good choice because of the economic environment. Um, Kenya, good place because of the economic environment. Right? So a lot of other things come into play when you're choosing a location. Well, here we go again, back to my favorite slide. Validated learning. We learn something. We learn something that we're much more careful now about where we're gonna put soccer balls. Uh, so, I'm sorry, stitching uh, plants. Uh, by the way, when I say plant, it's a 30 person room. It's not much bigger than this, okay? <laughs> It's not a big factory somewhere. Uh, but we learn that, and now we apply that principle whenever we look at starting a new, a new plan. Mm. Will, being Will, is, is very active on the charity circuit, um, very active in the entrepreneurial circuits in the UK. So he had a good idea. Wait a minute, so we're making soccer balls, and we want to give balls to kids to make sure they can play. And all of these other guys are also importing soccer balls and giving them to kids to play. Why don't we team up? So now we make soccer balls in Africa for these and a lot of other organizations. Right? They buy the balls in Africa and distribute them in Africa. That's why our, on our logo, if you look on the ball, what does it say on there? Alive and picking. Made in Africa, by Africa, for Africa. Is that all that I made this step up, I was like, <laughs> well, you get there. It's now made in Africa for Africa. Very, very cool. So we can't supply all of the needs of these guys, obviously. Still a lot of balls being imported. But remember I said we're now making balls out of leather rather than plastic. The balls typically last up to six months rather than six weeks out of leather. The leather balls are the plastic balls, which is pretty cool. We can now get uh, our balls in the hands of many, many more people. Yeah? All right. One of the other things that, uh, that he did, that Will did, um, is that from the UK here? Okay, good. Then you know about John Lewis partnership. Oh, John Lewis, the stores. I know about John Lewis. John Lewis, right. Pretty big chain of stores, um, but they, they're fine. It's called John Lewis partnership because they run under a trust. They're not um, a public company. Uh, and part of their charter is to do good, is to do social work. It's very interesting. So Will went, went to them with this idea of, can we put soccer balls in your stores for you to sell? And I said, sure, but then you're just like everybody else. Just like Nike, just like all these, 
And it's just another wall, oh, by the way, it's twice as expensive. Hmm. Because of the, the labor and, and import costs. So I got back together, thought about it some more, um, and came up with a very interesting idea. You'll, you'll see, actually, this is the only ball that's packaged. None of the other balls are packaged. You get a you order a ball, you get a ball. That's it. No packaging now. This one comes in a, in a brown paper, a brown cardboard box, like that. And inside that box is a code. It's a number. When you buy the ball, you donate a ball to Africa. And that number is the number of the ball that's going to be donated in Africa. So two weeks later, after you buy this ball, you can go to their website, put in the number, and find where that ball went. It's kind of a cool gimmick. You buy one, you give one. It's a donation. Right? Very, very interesting <coughs> approach to that. So now, okay, John Lewis, you're right. We're not just selling balls, but look at the social good we're doing here. Very interesting approach. I think so, and so do you, right? Yeah. Good. So now what? Well, demand stops at shipping supply again. So, we open our third stitching center. It's once in Ghana. You have all the way across the continent, about as far away as you can get. Right? Why was that? Why did we open it there? Because the two stitching centers in Tanzania and Kenya said, these guys are having financial difficulty. We should go over there and help them. We should go and help this out. So we apply the test, what we call the South African test. You know, what's the economy like? What's the government like? The government in Ghana, by the way, is very stable. It's a very, very democratic country. No insurrections, no uh, you know, murderous tribes, nothing like that going on. Very stable country. The economy is stable, but poor. Um, the health condition is they, they have a lot of uh, a lot of health problems, especially AIDS, like they do in all of Sub-Saharan Africa. So it met all of the tests that we learned from South Africa. So instead of somebody going, actually a bunch of people going from Europe to from the UK out there, a bunch of people from Kenya and a bunch of people from Tanzania went out there, helped find a location, open a factory, hire people, train people, and do some pretty cool stuff. They also had another idea though, that Nobody in the UK had thought of. When you're disabled in Africa, you beg. That's your only income, pretty much. Right? You've seen that, I'm sure. <clears throat> so they hired 50% of the workforce in this new stitching center but disabled in some way. Mm -hmm. Missing a hand, missing legs from landmines or around them. They're disabled. Very cool. We never thought of that. Those guys over there thought of that. How can we help somebody else? They were infected with this self-organization, with this, this social enterprise mindset. I think that's pretty good. I hope you think so too. I keep saying that. I'm enthusiastic about this stuff. Here we go, back to this one, yet more validated learning, right? So the guys in Africa had done this stuff, they validated it, they understand it, they know what's happening, and they're gonna share that with their colleagues, <coughs> their new colleagues that they're hiring. Are they making money? Um, the plant in Kenya is making money at this point. Primarily because they are making uh, synthetic soccer balls, and they're selling those to the UK. Um, they're also making leather balls that they're selling to other charities, so 50-50 mix, essentially. Uh, the, uh, uh, let me go back here. Um, the plant in Tanzania is essentially breaking even, because they're making primarily leather balls uh, for other charities. And we don't want to you know, make a lot of money off those guys, right? But it's got to be self-sustaining. Um, the plan always in Ghana, no. So is the business model to be self-sustaining? Absolutely, absolutely. So we only considered opening the Tanzania um, uh, operation when Kenya almost, was almost self-sustaining. We only considered the Ghana operation when Tanzania was self-sustaining, almost self-sustaining. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's absolutely the model. Sorry, just to just remind, you said it started with a 12,000 pounds gram? Yeah. So that's the only money that was invested in it? Um, that's the only, let me say, charitable money, the only grant type money. Okay. Um, there are people like me, thousands of people like me, who give them money, who give as, them as charitable. Charity. As, as, as a charitable gift. Right, okay. right. Um, because I think they're doing the right thing. No investment, no business angels, no VCs. Nope, nope. Absolutely. I mean, what a great business, right? <laughs> 
So when the decision was made to go to Dada, is the entire factory of 30 deciding that? How is that done? Yeah, they, they have a workers' committee. They do. Okay. I don't want to get to the communism discussion. <laughs> <laughs> but they have a workers' committee, uh, and they meet every week. They do a retrospective every week, by the way. Nice. Yeah, it's lightweight. Trust me, it's lightweight. Yeah. You know, what, what did we screw up? What happened? Let's fix that. But through that, that arrangement, both factories um, said, where should we go? And they both had different ideas. So then they sent some representatives to meet to decide where to go next. Now. They still needed permission. It wasn't really permission at that point, but uh, the OK from the charity in the UK, because they have to be seen to be guiding decisions. Otherwise, they're not a charity anymore. But yeah, the, the, the motivation here to go to Ghana came from the two, the two lines. All right, where was I? Oh, yeah, I did that. Um, validated learning. But now we've got this one, too. Accounting. Can we make money? So that was a great question you asked. I was about to talk about it here. Good job. You looked ahead, right? <laughs> yeah, right here. Yeah, right there. <laughs> right. So I've got to decide to make money and invest it wisely. And I've got to invest skills wisely. Remember the, the, the debacle in South Africa? All the time and effort that went into opening that plant, gone. They didn't want to do that again. So they were very careful about opening this third stitchery. That's not the end of the story, of course. That's where we are now. We have three, three plants. Ghana is not making money yet. Um, they've been open a year, effectively. But getting close, getting very close. They also are making a mix of uh, synthetic balls and leather balls, which we, we're finding actually <coughs> is a harder model to make sustainable. Because half the balls I make, I'm essentially selling at my cost. A little markup, but at my cost. Um, the the uh, factory, the stitchery in Kenya is making most money because that's mainly synthetics for export. Mm -hmm. um, and then the one in, uh, in Zambia is breaking even. So it, it's a good business model. Um, still need to tune it, still need to do some other stuff. Um, now I say it's not the end of the story because recently there was a change in leadership in Alive and Kicking in the UK. I said my friend Will left and the, the incoming uh, president, Sudra, is now coming up to speed with all of these principles. So who comes out of the not-for-profit world has been a, a director before and is a really, really cool person. But she's having to come up to speed with, what, what the heck are you guys doing? You know, charities typically do a lot of planning. They do a lot of waterfall stuff, right? Um, I'm gonna write some grants, I'm gonna get some money, I'm gonna do some cool stuff with that money, but the first thing I do is make a big plan build a Gantt chart, find some people, and then we're going to spend the money later, right? This ANK doesn't work that way. ANK decides, we're going to do something, then we'll find the money, and while we're finding just enough money, we'll actually do something, measure it, learn about it, and make it successful. Not me making it successful, it's just my idea. This was Jim's vision all along. Not just me, not just my idea. You guys are going to make it successful because I'm going to give you the means to do so. So if you do this in your organization anywhere, be careful that you don't want to take control back because you're not going to be able to. The small companies I've worked with in Lean Startup, their workers, their employees, their developers start owning the company. I mean owning mentally. Right? So if you decide you want to do this as an experiment and then take power back at some time, you're out of luck. Or you've got to get rid of everybody. So be careful. It's really, really powerful. Really powerful. So that's the point here, right? Um, you can't just turn them off. You either get it and fully accept it, or you don't. There's no middle ground, in my opinion. All right, so these were the three things. That's so what I'm going to tell you about the, the operation and the live kick. I'm going to tell you what they did and how they achieved their goals. And then we're going to come to the fun part for me. Um, three goals. Create sustainable employment in the manufacture of sports balls. Ensure disadvantaged children have access to balls of play. And using sport to raise awareness in sub-Saharan Africa. Right? Those were the three goals that Jim put together in 2000. We're now in 2013. How did we do with those? It took a long time, I'm going to be honest. It took a long time. These were figures I got last week. So Alive and Kicking employ 120 people directly. Of 
about 40 in each place. Ghana has 30, Kenya has the other. 120 people. Each of those has a family of six people, again, <coughs> on average. So we're supporting 720 people from making software <coughs> for in a sustainable business. That's pretty cool. I'm really proud of that. But I didn't think about this other benefit. These guys have to buy food, right? They buy clothes. They pay taxes, believe it or not. So about 12 other people in the community benefit from every person employed at a live and My God, I am stunned at that. For me buying a soccer ball, I'm supporting 2,000 people making a living. Now is that a socially conscious business? Gosh, I think so. I think that's amazing. I, I, my hat's off to these guys. I could never have envisioned this. Um, ensuring disadvantaged children have access to balls to play? Yeah, that was the number one goal. Right. I'm sorry, that's not the number one goal. That's where we started from. This is the number one goal. So we're now supporting all these charities. We're selling balls to these charities and selling balls in the UK, hopefully the US soon. Um, but we're, then we're definitely meeting this goal. Um, one thing that we learned, here you go, uh, validated learning. On the white balls out there, it says 250,000 balls distributed. Right? I think that's pretty good. Except this ball's a year old. It's now 400,000 balls distributed. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So I think we're doing that. I think we're meeting that goal. This, though, is, is one of the coolest goals of all. Using sport to raise health awareness. I'll give you an example of just one thing that Alive and Kicking did last year, 2012. It's, um, uh, they do road shows, and they partner with road shows, right? They partner with the local health clinics, local hospitals, and other uh, not-for-profits, other charities in the area. So one road show um, over 10 days, put on some sports clinics, put on a couple of tournaments, um, and here's some statistics here, right? 935 children uh, attended HIV education how to have safe sex, what it really means. Children in Africa, very unusual, getting education on this. Educate the parents and help it passes on. Uh-uh, we don't work that way. If you want to play in this tournament, you have to go through the education. That's part of the entrance fee. Very cool. So 935 kids attend an HIV clinic, education clinic. We also do a lot of testing and a lot of counseling, right? Um, I, I should have put a comparison up. When we did this 10 years ago in the same area, we tested about the same number of people, and I think 50% of them were positive for HIV. Now, only two out of 90 in, in one area. So in total, 18 out of 400 people. It was almost 50% at one point. So that's, again, good news, bad news. People are definitely getting the message. What's happening to the other? I'm afraid to die. Not a lot we can do about that. But we can stop future people from dying. So that's a bit of a gamut to end on, isn't it? <laughs> but doing some good stuff. And we do typically one road show a month. Okay, again with parts. All right, this is what I've learned from working with ANK. By the way, I can take no credit for any of the work they've done. They have done, even if I wanted to. Um, I'm a consultant it's a, uh, in my profession, so I always have all the answers, right? That's what we consultants do. I've learned so much more from these guys than I, than I have uh, anywhere else recently. Right? I thought I knew it all. I know that much compared to these guys. So Lean Startup's been around for a long time, certainly long before Eric wrote book. Right? I think of all of these principles have. I said the only thing I'm maddest about is I didn't write it down first. Um, it's, Universal. Everybody does this. We just probably just don't think about it. It's fairly intuitive. You know, people do this stuff. People who are less educated. I'm going to go to Africa and I'm going to help Africa. I'm the great. What was it you said? The great white savior. Wow. Was that ever pounded out of me? I didn't ever feel that way, by the way. <laughs> but certainly, I'm, I'm very humble working with these guys. They're pragmatists. They do what do what works, right? Oh, geez, those balls aren't very good. What else can we do? What else can we make them out of? Have some ideas. We're sustaining now. Let's go and build another factory in another community to help another community. Very pragmatic. They do the right thing. 
people do the right thing. I think there's a, an innate goodness in most of us. And if you let people do that, they'll do the right thing most of the time. So, those are the five principles. Um, Alive and Kicking showed adherence to all these principles, maybe led the way in all these principles, even without knowing it, which I think is very cool. So, the fun bit for me. Um, there are some balls around here. Would everybody like to take a ball home with them? I brought ten balls with me. I don't want to take them home again. <laughs> <laughs> you would like to take one? One on your table? All right, one there, one there. Anybody else? Oh, look at all oh, now. Okay, I'm going to throw one in the middle of the floor. You have to fight for it. <laughs> Linda, I'm going to give you one because you really helped me with this. Thank you. Oh, maybe that's the test. If I throw it, you can't catch it. All right, so there's one on the chair there that somebody can grab. It's a lady at the back. There you go. That's why I don't play anymore. One more to give away. Did you want them? All right, good. Thing is, though, there's a condition. <laughs> Always get them the bait first, right? <laughs> I want each of you who've taken a ball to commit to giving your time to a not-for-profit. Any not-for-profit you like, I don't care. Do some good in the world. This has uplifted me so much. I can't. I get emotional talking about this. I'm sorry. God, 56 years old, doing this as long, and I get emotional. I know, it's ridiculous. So, I know I can trust all of you, right, to do the right thing. Yeah? Yes. Well, I don't. <laughs> I'm a consultant, 56 years old. <laughs> what I want you to do is get the email of one or two people next to you, around you. And when you do something for a not-for-profit, Email those people. Tell them what you did. Tell them why you did it. Inspire them too. So this is where you talk now to each other <laughs> and get their email. Give me my email. Yep. Oh, you can myself. Did you all get one email at least? I also want the people who are giving their email to get the email of the person with the ball. Are you taking the ball? Oh, we have one more ball here. We have one more ball here. I'll come to that in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so the people who are taking the ball, did you give your email to at least two people? The people who got the email, did you give your email to the person with the ball? Alright. I also want the person who's taking the ball to take my email and let me know what you're doing. I'd, I'd really like to know that. Okay. Again, voluntary, I am not going to come out here, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is that the people that, that took the balls, I guarantee, I guarantee I am the only person in the conference with an inflating needle in my pocket. <laughs> so if you need to deflate the balls, come and see me, we'll take the air out of it. Okay? If you, yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm sure you can take the air so out of it. So I'm coming back from London last year with 30 soccer balls. Mm. Right? And two bags. It's, they're really fun to transport. I get to, I get to customs in New York and they say, well, what's in the bag, sir? Oh, soccer balls. And no, no, really, what's in the bag, sir? <laughs> soccer balls. Yeah, let me show you. <laughs> like ten customs officers. Look, he's smuggling something in soccer balls. No, 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 really not. It was very interesting. <laughs> Alright, so that's what I want is, is for you guys to go and inspire yourselves and inspire some other people. That's really the payoff here of this entire session for me.
Um, if you happen to go and give money to Alive and Kicking, I think that would be fantastic. <laughs> Aliveandkicking.org. Um, they will ship to the US if you want to buy soccer balls. Um, they will take donations of, of money. Uh, and you can also buy the ball I talked about, John Lewis Partnership. You can buy that on the web too. Interestingly, I think they implemented this feature. You can buy the ball and donate it to a charity in the UK. How's that for being cool? Um, or, look at some of the other organizations. I get a lot of money from Kiva. Actually, I don't. Yeah. Kiva uses a lot of my money and recycles it. Brilliant idea. Brilliant idea. <coughs> You're a humane society. I don't care what you do. This is up to you guys. Be inspired. Be inspired. Go and do some good stuff. I'm Paul Ellaby, Alive and Kicking, really inspirational. Thank you for your time. <laughs> so this ball is going to a uh, after-school program in uh, New Haven, Connecticut. Disadvantaged you. Thank you. That is fantastic. Fantastic. I really appreciate that. Any other questions? If you want to chat? If you want to see me around? Um, I'm hiring, by the way. If you want a job. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I need devs, BAs, QAs, and more importantly, I need people to help me run workshops. So, I have a question. Can I, can I say, am I allowed to say that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a question about planning. If you had followed the traditional model, your board of directors would yep. have planned ahead. You would have had a succession plan, and you would have followed the traditional model of putting someone in place that would have carried the organization forward. Would that have been a good thing? Or yeah. was what happened here a good thing? Hmm. So the question is, had this been more traditional, uh, the board of directors would have had a big plan, a succession plan, plans in place for where we go next, all of those things. Would that have been a good thing? I think you still would have been just a charity. I, I, that's exactly, exactly how I feel. Obviously, I don't know, right? They might have put a great plan in place, but I think it would have been much more a charity. One of the important things to me is that the manufacturing side, the, 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 real, the real social enterprise side of Alive and Kicking is now not run from the UK. It's not run from a charity. It's run by the people doing the work in Africa. Huge, huge difference. So yeah, traditional plan, it would have all been centralized, right? Yes. Now these guys have decentralized in a big way. In a big way. So that's, that's the biggest single difference to me. Anybody else? Are you all ready for coffee? I think we're ending early, aren't we? Oh, even better. <laughs> Good. All right. If you see me around, you want to chat, I encourage you to do so. I'm here the rest of the day. I'll be getting drunk tonight. My, but my flight's at 6.30 tomorrow morning. Uh, okay, don't tell you. Uh, so, again, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it.